What's up, champs? Welcome to another episode of the Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast, brought to you by Keeping Carlson. I'm Jeremy Brasillo. Joining me tonight, my pal and yours, Shams Benamar. Shams, how are you doing on this very fine, first ever Frozen Frenzy evening? Oh, it's going good. Just nice to see. Now, I know a lot of people are complaining about like all the start sits situations, but I have abstained myself of just choosing the best players and then living with whatever happens. So I love just seeing all this hockey go and uh, happy to just see whatever happens and then uh, decide what to do on the slow days before and after. (laughs) Yeah, it's been a bit of a challenge finding streamers this week with only one game Monday and one game Wednesday. The Washington and New Jersey players were picked clean on my wire this morning And so I kind of just decided to go straight for Thursday, guys, and maybe hope to sneak an extra goalie start in later in the week instead of grabbing a third-line skater on a bad Washington team. Oh, yeah, I hear you. I have my only pickup so far was uh, Mario Friero because he just hits and blocks a lot. I think right now he has, like, four couple points and, like, one shot on goal just to show what he's done. And then... Most of my lineup changes are just going to be activating injured players and then seeing what I do for next week, most likely. Because, like, I'm with you. Like, now, if I saw it to the future and actually saw that Pearson was going to be as good as he was, that would have been a different pickup. But I'm not going to pick up line three, power play none person and hope that I'm going to get, you know, three points out of him. So I'm just not going to play that kind of game. Yeah. Shout out to all of you who saw the. 10 point outburst from Tanner Pearson yesterday. You have a very nice reward in your matchup. But let's get into the meat of our show today. Instead of bringing you news, since there's just so much of it on this Frozen Frenzy Day, we're going to let you follow that. And we are doing a special Do I Have Permission to Drop This Guy episode. We're going to bring up some mid to late round draft picks that people may be holding on to and we don't think you should be. And we're just going to give you permission to drop a bunch of these big names, but more fringy performance guys. And then we also asked our patron discord channel and the hashtag short shifts uh, channel for other guys that people had questions on. And so after the break, we're going to go back and forth with some of those. But first off, here is my first, you should drop these guys of the day is Anybody from my hometown Seattle Kraken, not named Jared McCann or Vince Dunn. Yes, that includes Beniers. Yes, that includes Tolvanen. Yes, that includes Grubauer. Uh, Shams, what do you think of that? Am I a bit too pessimistic on my hometown team? Or are these guys just streamers? I'm also, like, at that point, and the part for me is I'm kind of tempted to even add McCann to that because he randomly... Well, I hate this team just because... They don't decide who's a top line. It's just kind of, I call it line soup. There's just like four lines of players that have like any other team might have a fantasy relevant player if they are guaranteed minutes. So trying to guess who's going to get the points each day is annoying. And then also they're not really scoring that much. So in last season, they were getting enough points that, oh, you know, York Strand's on the third line, but if they're scoring five goals, maybe he gets a goal to assist somehow. But like when they're not getting any points and none of them are getting a decent amount of ice time, it is tough to get anything out of them. So I'm with you. Like, And also someone to add in mind is uh, I have in a league and I'm probably going to be dropping. It's Adam Larson because like even the people that don't have the points, like he's not even getting that many bagger stats because he might get like two blocks and a hit. So I'm at a point that I might be more interested in fantasy relevance. I can't believe I'm saying this out loud in Ducks players than Kraken, because at least with the Ducks, you know, the players that you care for, I don't know who I'm going to care for on a night by night basis with the Kraken. Totally. They really spread their shifts out pretty evenly. They did last year. And just to remind people, I'm not sure about your divisions, but in tier two of the cupful. I was streaming Beneers and Eberly and Tolvanen even at the end of last year. Like, if they weren't fantasy relevant last year, they definitely aren't fantasy relevant this year. But enough about my Kraken. That was uh, already more time than we should be spending on a bad team. Shams, why don't you pick off one of the many guys we have on our list here for our next discussion point? 
Uh, next on the list is Bertuzzi. Um, for me, is that as a Wings fan, he does have his bits and spurts. We remember how he went off on in Boston with all those points once he got traded. But like for me, is that he's just not getting enough of the important minutes. Sure, he's on line one, but he's on a power play one. And for me, it's just that. We talked about it in like past episodes of short shifts and also it's been brought up on main show is I'm not a fan of third wheels and there's no bigger third wheel than Bertuzzi. And also he's always hurt. Like even if he's playing, he's playing hurt. And I have a feeling that he is hurt because I think I remember seeing a tweet saying that he's not a hundred percent at the moment. So I am not interested in just like, crossing my fingers that he's just involved in a play with Matthews. I would rather have a person that could actually get the points on their own. I hear you there. No good power play deployment. Only playing 15-47 a night. And Matthew Nyes is looking pretty nice also and pushing him there. Speaking of third wheels, though, what do you feel about second wheels? Is Taylor Hall even worth owning playing with Bedard? Uh, Disregarding the fact that Taylor Hall is currently hurt but when he comes back, do you want him or are you just cutting him? So I actually made this decision before he got hurt is that I cut him just because while we're all fans of Bernard and we think that he could be great now into the future, the issue is, is that they're, the whole team is just getting shelled a lot of the games that like they don't have the opportunity to be on the offensive. So while he is put into a good position being on first line, first power play when he's healthy, he's just the whole team doesn't have a top opportunity to do anything with it because they're so rarely in an offensive situation that other than I believe it was like one or two games that he got a point, he barely got any value from a couple standpoint that I just wanted nothing to do with him, even though he had the point. I also cut Taylor Hall before he got hurt. I think Bedard is a great player and is going to be a superstar, but I don't think he's at that McDavid or Crosby hard carry all your line mates and make them fantasy relevant level. Uh, Bedard is a lot smaller than McDavid and Crosby, and especially as a younger guy, that makes it that much harder to impose your will on people. I mean, I'm pretty sure Bedard is four inches shorter than McDavid, so even if they had the same skill set, McDavid just has better reach, better length on his stride, and a more physical presence to kind of keep people off of him. So yeah, that's a a second wheel that I'm willing to let go of if he's eating up a roster spot instead of an IR slot. Uh, I don't think there's much need for discussion on this one, so chime in if you do. Another third wheel you can cut is Connor Brown. He hasn't even been playing with McDavid all the time. He's not even close to getting power play time. Uh, yeah, that's that was a shot in the dark that people were taking late that I think that experiment's over. Oh, yeah, it was worth the draft pick to take the shot, but now you have the information, so go off and stream someone else. Next up, we have uh, a guy who's been a really nice late fantasy pick for many, many years, Anders Lee. Uh, he is no longer playing on Power Play 1. He's no longer playing with Barzal, and... He's an Islander also, so that's never good for his point totals. Even in banger leagues, I don't know if I want Lee on my roster at this point. I think he's kind of hit that classic 33-year-old power forward cliff that we see, you know, guys like James Van Riemsdyk and Jamie Benn before some random resurgences hit. Just really hard to play your game at that age. So one small update is recently Lee is actually on line one with uh, Horvat and Barzell. So not much to show of it. Like, not sure if the goal that he got was with that or somewhere else. So I'm with you is that he's no longer the, oh, I have to keep him. Like this guy, I think before the others were like, I don't want anything to do with Hall or Connor Brown. Lee is kind of that second class of you don't have to keep him. If you find someone better, go ahead and take them as a place. But I feel like Lee might have fits and spurts where he has some value and he might live on your team. But don't make it feel like, 
oh, he's line one or, oh, Anders Lee has done this in the past. I have to keep him kind of mentality. Gotcha. I can see that point of view. I think I would have no trouble completely jettisoning him. I don't know what the Islanders' upcoming schedule looks like, but certainly if he ends up with a two-game week, I don't think you can keep him if your team's that good. Like, if he's one of the better players on your team, you've got bigger problems. Sorry. Next up, we've got a pair of defensemen who were kind of drafted for the same reason. These guys are minute-munching, good transitional real-life guys who were just handed massive contracts, but aren't on power play units usually and aren't really fantasy relevant. I'm talking about Hampus Lindholm and Dmitry Orlov. Would you be reticent to get rid of either of those guys? I would be fine with cutting them because basically the idea is that I put Adam Larson in the same group. It's that we, you know of your, say, your Trubas, the people that, or your nurses that are known for getting a lot of value from their hits and their blocks or their shots. Uh, Lindholm and Orlov are kind of in that second class, but the issue is, is that you got to pay attention to what they're actually doing. And right now, Lindholm and Orlov are not getting your hits and blocks. So now that they're not doing that and they're not scoring, they are just wasting on your line right now. And right now, like you could probably get, like, and say in a couple situation that it's a points league and not a categories league, you could probably get more fantasy points with two games from a forward versus four games from an Orlov at this point, even though they might be doing something from a real hockey standpoint. Right now, if they're on a team right now, it's probably more name value than anything else. I would totally be taking Adam Larson over either of those guys. Even if you look back at last year's stats, Larson averages two blocks and two and a half hits per game in addition to whatever he's pinching in as far as points and shots go. Meanwhile, Lindholm and Orlov are more like one to one and a half of each per game, and that's a lot of fantasy points. Like, Larson's hits and blocks so far this year can get you through those tough times without any points or when the Kraken are struggling to score. Not so much the other two guys on that list. All right, we got... One more forward to look at. Dawson Mercer is just a victim of a really good team, I think. He's a young budding star. He's really good. But he's also playing on the third line on a team with really strong first and second lines. I don't think he's going to end up with much opportunity there. If there's an injury in the top six... Yeah, I'd grab him pretty quick, although he may not even be first in line there with them trying to get Alexander Holtz some opportunities. Uh, But for now, I don't think I really want anybody not on that Hughes or Hishier line in New Jersey. What do you think? 100% with you. Right now, Mercer on 5v5 is playing with Halla and Holtz. And right now, maybe Halla is a streamer kind of level person that for deep leagues, so he's not getting a sniff of any of that time, and he's on power play two, and to my understanding, there was more of a kind of like 50-50 power play at the moment, or at this point, it's much more an actual power play one and power play two, where top is actually getting a decent amount of time, so I have zero reservations on dropping Mercer, and I would have been of the mind that you probably should have dropped him like Last week, I believe it was like a week or so ago when he got cemented to the third line because he wasn't even producing when he was on the top two lines, but you could make an argument, oh, he's with one of the great guys, but now he's not producing and he's not with good players, so cut away. Next up, but for the last one of our suggestions, I've got three goalies for you, and I'm interested to hear what Shams thinks. I would be cutting Logan Thompson, Stuart Skinner, and Darcy Kemper. Thompson and Skinner both are on the wrong side of a 1A, 1B, it looks like. Uh, Jack Campbell has been outplaying Skinner so far. Aiden Hill has been keeping the net that he rightfully earned with the cup run last year, although Thompson has not been bad by any means. And Darcy Kemper is on a team that looks downright terrible. I 
legitimately think the Caps are a bottom five team this year, and I don't see why you'd hold Kemper over even like John Gibson is someone I see similarly currently. I guess Kemper's getting more starts than Gibson, but Carter Hart and Darcy Kemper may be equivalent, but Hart's a much better goalie. Would you be holding on to any of these three, or am I right to say cut them? So for me, Skinner, I'm with you 100%. He's not getting the volume, and he's not getting the play skills, so out with him. Thompson, I would be considering keeping him around in maybe categories leagues as maybe a third, just because what he does play, he does great, but that one is kind of on a teetering edge. And if you end up needing to cut him, I would not have any issue. Points leagues, not a question. And then Kemper, goalies on bad teams have a thing in my heart of just because they get like, especially the ones that get a lot of volume. So the scary thing is, is that he's doing very poorly to the point that he's getting negative points. So I would have him on maybe my short list on say if you're in a league that doesn't have a like another starting goalie that you could take even one of a poor like maybe you swap them out for Gibson that's getting something but like if you don't have a starting goalie that you could pick up maybe I'd give Kemper a few more starts just to see maybe something turns around but I would be a little bit hesitant just to cut it because I just love my volume irregardless of how bad the team is. I'm with you in loving volume goalies and. I honestly haven't looked enough as to how many shots the Caps are giving up, but the key to a volume goalie is they need to be facing 35 to 40 shots a game. That's why I love my uh, Mackenzie Blackwood or uh, last year's Arizona goalies. If it's a guy giving up 30 shots a game or a team giving up 30 shots a game and the goalie only letting in five goals, that's a rough fantasy own. So I'd have to look a bit more into the shot volume the Caps are allowing on defense. Oh, yeah, it's He's like, just for me, just to be clear, he's like just on the edge of getting cut for me. I'm not trying to make it sound too much that I'm like willing to keep him. It's just more of just goalies with volume are such a rare case. So like, I'm willing to give him just a little bit more rope, but it's not too much. Well, with that, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back with some of the patron-requested cut possibilities. Welcome back. Before we get into the patron requests that I tease, Shams and I real quick want to give a list of guys not to drop, but maybe relegate to your bench until further notice. These guys were probably a bit too high in draft capital to be a straight drop, but they're getting on my nerves. Evander Kane, Nikolai Ehlers, Braden Shen, Pavel Zaka, Michael Bunting, Alex Tuck, who actually had a great game on my bench today, so maybe don't listen to me. Nick Suzuki and Pavel Buchnevich. Any of these guys easy cuts for you, or do you mostly agree with the, yeah, you got to hold them, but they've been disappointing? Out of all of them, I think the one closest to a cut is Bunting. Because right now, he got put into a fourth line with like Randall Lemieux, and I think it was like Chris Drury. I'm not even sure what his first name is be perfectly honest, but Jack, um, Jack okay, I think there is anyway. <laughs> um, Son of so, There we go, okay, I knew there was a connection somewhere. Um, basically, if that holds, then it's a clear permission to cut. It's just more of Aho was a game time decision, so maybe they're doing some wide things, so that one is a easy cut if he loses his Aho exposure, even if he's still on power play one. If he's not on top, any of the Top two lines, I have no interest in them. The others, I feel like have enough skill of their own and like volume that they're already getting that maybe it might be a situation that while they're annoying, I just don't feel like there's going to be a someone with the potential of them on the waiver wire that you can easily replace depending on the seat you're in. I tend to agree with you. Bunting, I think the deployment is going down, therefore he could be cut. I think you could say the same thing about Pavel Zaka. I don't think he's guaranteed that top line spot in Boston. If he ever loses that, you can cut him. Even if he keeps it, I wouldn't fault you for it. 
But next up, we have some listener requests. We did not track names on who requested these. Uh, so if you asked one of these in chat, thank you. And we hope that we will give you the correct advice. First one is a pair of goalies, Ilya Samsonov and Yunus Korpisalo. I would personally be holding Samsonov a bit longer, but it does look like Joseph Wohl has taken that job. Even Elliot Friedman on 32 Thoughts is saying that Wohl could be the starter by the end of the year, if not already. I'm still holding Samsonov just to make sure that's the case, but if it's a 50-50 or worse, I would cut him. And then Corpusalo, I also think is a cut, although what's giving me pause is that Anton Forsberg had a total stinker today, so it may give Corpusalo a couple more games. I, I have him in cupful, and I think I'm going to hold for the rest of the week, but I'd be more likely to cut Corpusalo than Sammy right now. What do you think, Sams? I'm in the same boat as Samsonov is attached to a good enough team that if he plays, and even if he plays poorly, you can get the wins, which either are going to give you a decent amount of points in points leagues or help you in the categories leagues. So it is a wait and see for his deployment. And then for Corpusalo, even when he was playing, I think he had like one good game, but like other than before that or after that, he hasn't been playing so well that he was one of those zero G goalies that you drafted late or took a swing on to hope that everything worked out. But like, I would not hesitate to cut him because he's not getting the playing time and he's not playing well with the time that he has. So I'm not a big fan of him in general. Yeah, with those late goalies on, Ottawa's not even a bad team, but I think they're going to be a high-scoring game team. You really need them to be starting almost all of their team's games, like, uh, say, Elvis Merzliskens or Vili Husso, in order to have that kind of value from a team that isn't going to lock it down defensively. Next up, we had a request for Kirill Marchenko who wasn't even drafted in most leagues, but was a hot early pickup. I'm still in the camp that Marchenko has found money, and while he does have nice deployment, he's still a third wheel, a third wheel with potential, but I have no issues getting rid of Marchenko. I don't think he's done anything in Columbus's game today. He may continue to sit on that top line, but only be a 45 or 50 point guy. Is there anything I'm missing here, Shams? Now I'm in agreement, and then we got to keep in mind, we're talking the top line of Columbus, and I don't want to be mean, but not really a high-scoring team to begin with, so it's not as much of like being on the wing of like a offensive-minded team. So unless you're in the deepest leagues where you know that potential is there, and he is shooting a decent amount of times, but like, and I'm talking like deepest leagues, like deeper than Kakuffle, like more than 14 teams or larger benches, I would be probably cutting him elsewhere. Deep leagues and keeper leagues, he's definitely worth a hold. I uh, I actually am really high on Columbus this year as a team. I think they're going to push some teams for playoff spots. But yeah, I'm not, not interested in holding with the current deployments he's seeing. Like, it's nice, but it's not, not must-own territory. Who's next on our list, Shams? Owen Byram. And we could probably have put him in the Orlov and Lindholm spot of people with good names but not good production. Is that, for example, like he did get a goal today, which of course always looks nice. But before then, he only broke three cupful points. In one game, which is against Carolina, when he got a random assist. So, like, he's not shooting at all. He only has one game with two shots on goal. And then all the rest are either one and zero. And then he's, uh, hits and blocks are kind of all over the place. I understand. Colorado's a great team. You think that he could follow the points. I have nothing against him as a hockey player, but he's just like, 
third and wide at best because you got McCarr and Taves that are going to be the defensemen. They're going to get the power play time. So he's just kind of another guy that if it wasn't for the name, I don't think anyone would have any interest in keeping him. I'm a little bit higher on Byram. I actually have him in more the Adam Larson category where it could be worth it as your fourth defenseman. I think he hits and blocks more than both Lindholm and Orlov do, at least based on last year. This year, he's been a little bit slow to start. And I also think he has much more opportunity to get points at even strength. Last year, he was a pretty good fantasy own purely on even strength ice time. Uh, but overall, he's he's in that borderline case for me. Like, where would you rank uh, Byron compared to Larson? Do you have those flipped? I, I think I probably still have Larson first, but I think they're the same tier, same category. I would have Larson higher, but Byron could get you more points on a day-to-day basis. So it depends on if you want to be more swingy with your team. Byron would be higher, but for me, that wants a little bit more consistency and then puts my value in my forwards. I would rather have Larson. That makes sense. It's a bit of a floor versus ceiling argument. Speaking of players who are formerly high floor, at least, Vincent Trocek hasn't really done much this year. Personally, I'm still holding because I believe he's still on power play one. The Rangers have been really shuffling their lines a lot, trying to get Filipino, Alex Lafreniere, and Kako Capo going. Like, one of those three needs to take another step for that team to be a contender this year. And Trocek's been the one suffering while the line shuffling is going on. Are you still interested in Trocek? Uh, I think I still have him in the hold category. I have, and this is probably like, I wouldn't say like hot take, but like I have basically zero interest in Trocek. Like, I understand he's getting power play one, but once he lost a Panarin matchup of being on the second line and getting the power play one, I could make that sense. But like, depends on your league. But other than like, so right now they're playing Calgary and he has a shot on goal, but his two previous games, he did not even shoot once. So I have a feeling that, and we always talk about in the draft that you want to avoid, um, taking centers because they're so deep. So right now we're talking about a center-only player that's not getting the greatest deployment and is not really doing much with it. I have a feeling that you could find centers that give you more. And then it depends on how you are as a player. I am of the mind that if someone gets hot, I trust my ability to maybe pick them up off the waiver wire. But I would rather let someone else have this player birdie doing absolutely nothing. And then if he gets dropped, maybe try to pick him up if something happens instead of holding him and just wasting a roster spot, hoping something happens when he hasn't been doing anything with this deployment now. Point taken. The shots are a big concern that I hadn't really noticed. Uh, In the past, you could count on Trocek for three shots a game and two hits a game. Uh, The hits kind of look like they're still there. It's a bit hard to tell, but maybe he's not going to be shooting as much being buried on that third line, and that would be a death knell for his value. Who do you want to talk about next from this list? I think we have three or four more. uh, Say for me, and uh, we're talking about uh, a lot of the people that we want to cut. I'll bring up someone that I'm actually interested in, jumping a little off the list, is uh, the last person got suggested is Kadri. And while he hasn't been getting points, he has, um, not speaking about the current game, but the last two games, he got six shots on goal. And depending on if your league values shots on goal, either as a category or gives you a decent amount of points, I feel like they're putting Kadri as a player that, while he's not getting um, top line, top power play, like, He's the number one guy because I have one home. He is getting a lot of time to make some af- effort that even with the Flames not doing the greatest as a team, I feel like the fact that he is still doing something in the shots category makes me want to keep him. Depending on who's your worst guy, I would be surprised if he is your absolute worst. And if he is, sure, give him away. But 
with their shots at goal, there's probably someone that's getting, you know, one or two shots a game and then like an assist every third game. I'd be more interested in dropping like those kind of guys that if they don't get an assist, they do absolutely nothing versus dropping Kadri right now. Personally, I've still got Trocek over Kadri. That may be more because of my affinity to banger players, but I just see Calgary as a one-line team when in the past and when uh, Kadri was relevant, they were more of a two-line team, and I think he's just in trouble. Oh yeah, it's really more of just if he keeps on shooting. Like, if the shooting drops off, I'm 100% with you, and because he did have a set of games that he was only doing two or one shots. If he went back to that version, go ahead and cut him. But with the Columbus game and the Detroit game, he had six shots in each of them, so 12 in total. If he keeps it up to somewhere near that range, I could live with it, the points. But if he goes back to the one or two shots and no points, I'm with you. Like, at least Trocek has better players around him that I would consider, but I would still consider both cuts at that point. Yeah, if Kadri can keep up the shots, it gets very interesting. The next guy on our list is Owen Tippett. Do you, are you worried about Tippett this year? He hasn't been getting as good of deployment. Konechny has been absolutely killing it, but Tippett isn't on that line. I think I'd be fine cutting Tippett. I just don't think the Flyers are a very good team, so I don't really want a middle sixer from a bad team. Yeah, I feel like this is going to be a person I kind of put into the Lee category as I could see him on and off my team, depending on situations or schedules or if he likes on a hot streak. But I don't vision him as a day in, day out. I think, I'm not sure how it happened, but I used a lot of projections from different stat sites and those kind of things to find uh, who to draft. And he seemed to be a stat star A lot of people had him high up, and I didn't really bite luckily onto that. So I feel like he may have got drafted for that reason, and then people are feeling like they put in the draft capital. But honestly, he had the history about being a high draft pick, but nothing more than a streamer, in my opinion. I agree. He was a bit overdrafted. On the other hand, I did just look up his Frozen Tools page, and he is shooting three times a game, which is kind of like my benchmark for a fantasy relevant forward is I want three shots a game unless they have an elite skill elsewhere. So if he keeps that up, maybe he's just having some bad luck. I mean, he hasn't scored on any of his 15 shots so far. Maybe the story would be a bit different if he had two goals on 15 shots. Uh, I think Tippett's more of a watch list guy for me. I think those lines are going to jumble. I can't really tell what they're doing with power play units yet but I don't think you'll miss him if you cut him. There will be plenty of opportunities to add guys like Erod or uh, who else has been a, a popular guy early this year. I'm blanking on names, but there, there's guys like that on and off your wire all, all season. So if you cut him, you'll be able to get back someone roughly equivalent. Oh yeah. It's like other than Konechny and Couturier, I would say off the top of my head, is that those are the only two forwards I'd say from Philly that you have to have. And then the rest, the way that they play, like your Lawtons and whatnot, even your Cam Atkinsons, with Tippett in that category, feel like are going to be people that I could see flowing off and on my roster and don't have to live there. But other than Konechny and Torrey, I'm not a fan of holding long-term in a one-year league any of the other players. Last but not least, we have... Uh... Another third wheel, actually. Um, Ivan Barbashev, who has been playing with Eichel and Marsha Show over in his new team in Vegas, but hasn't done anything with it. Uh, I forget if he has any points yet, but he hasn't had many shots. And yeah, I, I'm fine cutting Barbashev. He looked great last year playing next to Eichel, but that magic looks like it's worn off and he's not on the main power play unit for Vegas, as it appears they're now running in more traditional power play, having lost Riley Smith to Pittsburgh. Oh yeah, it's. I think this was kind of a mix, is that last season, I'm with you, I streamed him in a couple leagues and loved it as a third wheel, and then also, he did get a goal 
in his first game and then also had good amount of shots in his first uh, three games. But his last three games, or uh, yeah, his last three games, they haven't played uh, tonight yet. So these are three full games. He doesn't have a shot in any of them. Zero, zero, zero. And then his hit totals are one, one, two. He didn't breach one cupful point in any of his last three games. And he's averaging like 13 to 14 minutes. Throw him away. If he gets hot, just be quick on the add button. But right now, zero reason to keep him on your roster. I didn't even notice the minutes were that low. That makes me even more confident in my call to cut. I do think he has some moderate value in banger leagues. I think he's going to be closer to two hits a game than one. But yeah, that there's not much points upside here. I think he's truly going to be a... You know, the grinder to go with the, with the playmaker and the scorer for you uh, EA NHL people. Is that reference even relevant? That may even be like 10 years ago EA NHL and they've changed the system. Well, uh, since we're now devolving into video game hockey instead of fantasy hockey, I think it's time to call it a night, Shams. Do you have any final words before we sign off? Uh, one last note, and I thank you because a lot of people have cut this person, but... If you cannot put NA players on your IR, drop Patrick Kane. So I'm just going to close off with that. Most people have already done it, but if you're looking at your roster and you somehow still have him, just drop him. You'd be fine with just not even picking up anyone and then waiting until another day because that's going to give you the exact same amount of points as keeping that guy in your roster. Yeah, we're hearing all this news about him skating and being ready for contact. I'll believe it when I see it as far as him joining another team. I think it's going to take a while before someone's ready to sign him. And then he can go on your IR at least. But I think even once he gets signed, it's probably going to be another month before he's playing games. With that, thank you for joining us. Be sure to give us a follow at ShortShiftsKK, as well as Brian and Elon at Keeping Carlson. I recommend you follow at Game Day Lines, at Game Day Goalies, at Game Day News NHL, and at Game Day Stats NHL. All organized nicely at the site GameDayTweets.com. Visit that site and other great sites we use to do our research with at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, ShiftChart.com, Icy Data, and Natural Stat Trick. Those are some new ones in there. Someone edited that. Our intro and outro music was created by Pat Roach, and John Reed is our digital media producer. Until we see you next time, play smart and keep your shifts short.